Yeah, uh, just there. Uh, hi, um, thank you so much for your talk. I thought it was really instructive and very informative. Um, my question is, so you talked about the two reasons as to why you think the Conservative Party is struggling to get votes right now in this current election. Do you not think that a third reason might be that the electorate has started to reject the narrative given by the conservative right, given by the conservative media. Um, for the last 30 years, we've had a narrative given by the media, given by the right-wing political party, saying that we need austerity, that we need greed, not good. And do you not think that perhaps you know, in, in America we're seeing an election where inequality is becoming the, the narrative set by Hillary Clinton and by Elizabeth Warren. And in, um, in Europe you're seeing Spain uh, possibly electing a anti-austerity party. In Greece they've elected a anti-austerity party. Do you not think that part of the reason why the Conservatives can't get votes is because the electorate is fed up of the neoliberal economic model which has been proved not to work? Well, I think I start by taking issue with the, with the final premise, which is it's been proved not to work. It, there is, I mean, I think there is a profound issue. Western Europe since the, and indeed the Western world since the end of the Second World War, has existed quite substantially on borrowing to supplement tax uh, in order to pay for public services. I think it's Angela Merkel who you know, made the point, Europe, 7% of the world's population, 23% um, of its GDP, uh, uh, and 50% of, of its welfare. And we've done that because we wanted to create a humane society. Um, but we have engaged in long-term deficit financing. And of course, back in the 1950s, the world was either made up of uh, the Western world, then there was the communist world, which was in many ways an economic basket case, and then there were places which were either colonies or ex-colonies, which were either becoming basket cases in some cases, or alternatively were actually economic, utterly economically dependent on the countries to which they supplied primary produce. Now, um, I think that's come to an end, and I think it's come to an end for good. And the big malaise that people have about the future, the fear you pick up, is the sudden realisation, you know, when I was young, you could, however badly Britain was doing economically, there was a vague sense that you could go to bed at night with this sort of lovely idea that the Western world was, whatever was going wrong, was dominant. It could call the shots. It could call the shots politically. In reality, it could defend itself. It was, uh, in a sense, it, it was cohesive and it had good rela inter interrelations. And it didn't have to worry about com competition. I think we do. There are lots of places around the world, you only have to look at it, whether it's China or India or Indonesia. They may have all sorts of problems, but they have also been shown that they can generate goods, produce, trade, and generate wealth. And I have, I have a sense that I have a doubt that we are ever going to be able to go back to the heady days when in this country, or anywhere in Western Europe, or the United States, we could borrow and spend in the way that we've done. Now, you say the neoliberal idea has broken down. I don't think I agree with you, because I would like, please, to have an explanation of an example of an alternative model, when most of the countries that have flirted with the alternative models have tended to move in the opposite direction. I mean, take Sweden, for example in an EU context, a country that actually has, in economic terms, completely reorientated itself from a social welfare policy of high tax towards a lower, because it saw that it was, in fact, undermining its ability to generate wealth. So I think there is a profound issue, and I'm not surprised that people, particularly, as I say, older generation people, it may also be younger generation, people with ideals, say, we don't much care for the harsh reality that we're being presented with. So the fact that we're having an election which is raising these issues and asking for them to be debated, and that people are hesitant, I think is right, quite apart from anything else. I mean, I know as an MP, looking at welfare change, for example, 
particularly because of the way in which if a minister sits at a desk and says we're going to have welfare change and we're going to re-scrutinise who is in need of welfare payments and who will be encouraged back into work, let's face it, it can be a pretty blunt instrument. As an MP, you have to intervene because ATOS, in carrying out its assessment, has clearly done it badly. Well, it's happened. All the, but that's not to say policy. <coughs> so my view is that this is a profound question. But the risk, Peter, each one of you is going to have to make up your mind about this. You may already have voted and done your postal votes. But you know, it's a big and profound issue. I happen to think that the suggestion... Firstly, I think you can exaggerate the austerity. We are still spending a very substantial amount of our national income on helping those who most need help. That's the first thing. The second thing is that I happen to think that the idea that somehow you can start borrowing more money to chuck more money at those things which make you feel happier and more comfortable because you're helping those in need is delusional. Because where we have got ourselves collectively in the Western world is to put ourselves in the situation of debt and actually to encourage private debt as well <coughs> on a scale which I don't think is credible or sustainable. So, yes, a big question. Yeah, we'll take two at a time. Do you want to come back on it? You look, you look as if you were burning to say something else. <laughs> I guess rather than borrowing, how about taxing the rich when there's been such a a collective rush of capital to the richest pockets and when there's so many, you know, we talk about so much now about the 1% and, you know, multinational corporations that are making billions in profits and banks that are making billions in profits despite the profit coming Well, first, first, first we are taxing the rich. I mean, do bear this in mind. Um, the rich, the top 1% in this country are currently paying 30% of the tax, personal tax. Because they have a lot of money. Yes, they may have a lot of money, but it's gone up substantially from what they, the proportion that they were paying 15 years ago, when it was about 23%. Yes, it has. And I'd have no, I have no quibble with that, but I have to say to you that history tells me that when you start raising taxes, and particularly start raising personal rates of tax, much above the 40% mark, people stop creating wealth. And I look back to where we were, you know, there was a time under the Labour government before 1979 when the top rate of unearned income was 85 or even 90 percent at one stage. And the consequence of that was that wealth creation simply disappeared. There was no incentive. And the only revenue the state has is the industry and effort of the people who want to create it. There's no other money apart from the stuff you borrow, and that isn't your money anyway. So, for that reason, I happen to think very strongly, probably what makes me a conservative, that there are very clear limits. And history shows that if you tax less, your revenue in the medium to long term goes up. So, while I'm perfectly aware that we need to share the burden, and I don't object to paying higher rates of tax, and indeed we are paying higher rates of tax, not just for the top 1%, but lots of other people who are earning better more as well, I also think we have to be very careful about this issue. And uh, otherwise, what we will do is that, in fact, we go into the economic doldrums. And look at France, where the rates of tax are much higher than they are here. They've tried to maintain a social welfare system, which is probably unsustainable. And the French economy is in the most terrible mess. And anybody who's been over to France recently, and I, I know it, love it well because of my background, people are in despair about how France is going to revive. It will revive, but it will revive when a government starts exercising some common sense on the limits of what its expenditure could be. Thanks so Two much. questions, gentlemen here, and just over there. How would you explain the decline in support for the Lib Dems uh, since entering the coalition? I fear that the, they, they probably best are better best place to answer it. But I mean, I, to my mind, the Liberal Democrats have suffered very badly from the fact that in the 2010 election they made a series of promises which were very clear, and they then had to abandon. Uh, and they have not been successful in justifying that abandonment because I think that there's a perception that they were deceived, that in a sense they made those promises because they never thought they would be in government. That's how it comes across to me. Um, uh, 
it, my party may be advantaged by the Liberal Democrats' decline. Actually, there may also be some disadvantages to us if we have to form a coalition with a smaller number of Liberal Democrats, but we may win some Liberal Democrat seats. That's the swings and roundabouts of politics, but if that's the basic issue, I can't really think of anything else they've done that justifies the public opprobrium, and yet they are very unpopular. But then you see, you know, in my constituency, which is pretty conservative, school hustings, sixth form hustings in 2010, would always consistently deliver Liberal Democrat majorities over tuition fees. There's no sign of that today when I've been doing it in this election at all. And I think that indicates the extent to which there was a creation of a sense of real disappointment and people feeling that they'd been let down. Well, I happen to think that the promise was, in the first place, completely unrealistic. But that's, you, know, you, you make your decisions and you pay the penalty for it. But that's the reason. I don't think there's a sudden decline in liberalism with a small L exists in quite a few of the mainstream political parties. I don't happen to think that that as a phenomenon is in decline. And just the other question here. Um, Philip Gould, uh, Tony Blair's um, former post, used to say that there's a curious paradox that um, the Conservatives were far more willing to reinvent themselves um, than the progressive left. Um, after kind of the struggles of the Tories in the past couple of elections, um, even against weak opposition with fairly favourable um, conditions, do you think it's time for the Tories to reinvent themselves again? And what kind of form would you expect that today? I'm a bit wary of reinvention. I think all parties, I mean, to begin with, all political parties have to adapt to change because change is taking place whether the political party wants it or not. Uh, if you have some basic philosophical principles, which I think my party does have, they are capable of quite a lot of flexibility in their application. At various times, the Conservative Party or Conservative-led governments, like the coalition government during the Second World War, has presided out of necessity in massive surges in public expenditure, um, created highly regulated state because necessity required it. Um, but in an ideal world, we are quite light touch when it comes to government, although we're certainly not neoconservatives. I mean, I want to make that quite clear. You know, we believe that we need to have a duty to look after those who are disadvantaged and in need, and a need to try to help those who are disadvantaged and can be helped, for example, into employment. Very important considerations. Um, there are a number of things that I think the Conservative Party does have to do, um, partly because they're areas where I've devoted quite a lot of my time in the last 10 years. I think that we have a legacy in respect of our dealings with ethnic minorities, which means that we are not as attractive as we should be, particularly to ethnic minority, uh, members of ethnic minorities, who in fact are aspirational in a way that the Conservative Party ought to have more appeal to them. Now, in my constituency, People may think leafy Buckinghamshire, but actually I've got a very big Asian community and it's growing very quickly. I'm delighted to say that I think most of them vote Conservative, but that's quite unusual. Uh, and it varies very much depending on countries of origin and the political traditions from which people have come and to which they integrated when they were here. So I do happen to think that that's an area that is, is, should be an absolute priority for my party. Um, there may well be other things that we need to look at but I'm not sure it's reinventing ourselves. I think language matters. And I made the point earlier about the challenge that I think all political parties, mainstream parties, have got over language at the moment. I do think the electorate are sending some very clear signals out about their dissatisfaction with the current language of politics. And the most obvious example is Prime Minister's question time. Uh, and not so much, perhaps, that it's the noise, because Parliament's always been noisy, and that's actually is one of its attractions. It's an informal environment. But I think it, we're in danger, perhaps, of turning into meaningless rituals, which are not, in fact, dealing with the issues. And that's troublesome. I think you know, there, is, there is a beacon, a warning beacon there for the politics in the United Kingdom at the moment. And that's, as I said, one of the reasons, I think, why people have been attracted to political parties with very simple messages, such as the SNP and UKIP. And we've got to wake up to that.
because if we don't, then I think it could be very damaging for our future, because we've got to be able to recognise the need for engaged debate in the public space, and I don't think that's happening in the way it should. And for me, the two things I've just identified are probably the key things for my own party, but there may be others. Um, people make the point, you know, they look at me and say, your, your, your sort of profile is typical Tory. Uh, maybe, actually it's not, I think, representative of the party in Parliament. I think there are people who be quite surprised about the varied backgrounds of Conservative members of Parliament. But that said, uh, you're a national party, you've got to have appeal in a very broad way. Uh, and uh, there's more work we need to do on that as well. Um, yeah, you, and uh, just at the back there. Just, yeah. um, in the modern times, when um, the, I'm not sure the figure, but 80 90% of the, the population, sorry, I turned that question around. Um, we used to have a time when you know 80 90 percent of the population voted for the two two main parties uh, and we don't anymore now um the liberals have obviously filled that gap in the 2010 election and you could argue that that's kind of moderated the conservatives fine but if we're moving into a period where um, it's going to be the norm to have coalitions is it not potentially dangerous that other than the liberals the other key players that could form a coalition tend to be one agenda parties like UKIP, um, they tend to be, well, SNP have one agenda in the UK, or just live in cloud cuckoo land like the Green Party. <laughs> <laughs> um, can I just, can we just take two at a time? Yes, of course, that's one, right. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, uh, going back to royal lobbying, um, the, I think the last thing he said was um, that uh, to be able to uh, do the work he does for government, Prince Charles needs to be able to be in contact with ministers in private. Now, I'm not a legal expert and I don't know an awful lot about the Freedom of Information Act, but I think um, me and a lot of people who are following the case in the media were, uh, would be worried um, by... Uh, the heir to the throne who's not an elected, rep elected representative of anyone. Um, we'd be worried that he shouldn't uh, be able to wield any political power over and above what any normal citizen does, what any normal member of the electorate does. So um, is there not a concern when he's doing his um, correspondence with ministers in private, when he's sending um, 27 um, 27 letters to seven different government departments between eight, September and April uh, 2004 to 2005, when he's had 36 private meetings with ministers in this current parliament. Um, probably more by now, you know better than I do. But, um, you know, <laughs> uh, but the, um, would you, um, can you not see that it's possibly a bit of a uh, concern to a lot of us that given that he's got this kind of special position Compared to um, compared to other citizens, we're not um, we're not all heirs to the throne after all. That um, he could be abusing his position in private. You say he isn't, but why should we have to take your word for it? Shouldn't we be able to um, Shouldn't we be able to judge for ourselves that there's nothing of substance in these letters? Should you go for that? Right. Well, let's take the the, the two in turn. Start with the cuckoo um, bit. Um, you make a very interesting point. The two main parties are undoubtedly coalitions of interest of their own. Uh, within the Conservative Party, you will find a broad range of views on different topics. And you will have the same in the Labour Party. Ultimately, what holds the political party together are ties of loyalty and affection. So that although you may actually sometimes find that you have quite considerable disagreements, almost like the coalition government we've just been talking about from 2010 with the Liberal Democrats, the loyalty and the respect is sufficient that you can shelve your differences or discuss them in private to maintain enough of a common front to run a political party and have a lot of internal debates which lead to the development of policy. And I actually think that's quite healthy. So the, the, the main parties are not monoliths. Now, you make a very important point, which is 
the two-party system broadly to work has operated since the Second World War until 2010 on the basis that one of the two main parties formed a majority. Very occasionally we've had minority government. Uh, if minority government becomes institutionalised, then it may well be that people are going to want to revisit our electoral system. Uh, and I'm, although I happen to think the first-past-the-post system, if the, we adjust the constituency sizes regularly, is a perfectly reasonable one, there are other models. But of course, the electric rejected AV, which is one possible other model, there's the French model, which is AV, but in a slightly different way, because you have two rounds, which I've always thought has some merit, personally, in allowing both the expression of opinion, but then narrowing down the choice. Um, but these are... Each one has a downside to it. There's no perfect system in all this. Um, but I think you... The point I just simply come back to is I think you can underestimate the extent to which the main parties are coalitions in themselves. And my concern is that, I mean, ultimately, I think the party structure broadly reflects what the electorate will respond to. You know, there is a green element of people around who are supporting the Greens. There is an element in our society at the moment that supports UKIP. Um, and there remains a tranche, and the SNP are clearly tapping into something in Scotland. It may be something that I find bothersome or worrying, but I can't deny that it must exist because they are able to tap into it. Um, and the SNP are entitled to put forward a narrow agenda if they want it. As I often say to my constituents, you know, people accuse them of being nimbys. And I say, well, actually, there's nothing wrong in being a nimby. I mean, of course, it's wise to be able to look at other people's interests in deciding how you should come to conclusions, but the democratic process is about the sliding of the tectonic plates between different interests. And those interests may be worthy, or they may be shown by history to be very unworthy. But that's what the process of democracy is all about. Prince of Wales, mm. I'm, I'm not a Republican. I believe in constitutional monarchy. And constitutional monarchy carries with it an implication that the monarch has within the state a role to play. And indeed, constitutionally, the Queen does have it. And ultimately, the heir to the throne is recognised because of its preparation to become um, uh, sovereign as having a role which is separate and distinct. It's not just politicians who write letters to each other. I mean, I write, when I was in government, I wrote confidential memos to uh, my colleagues, or some might be covered by legal privilege, but others would simply have been of a political nature, uh, which I couldn't write if they were to be put in the public domain because I'm entitled and it's necessary for government to work that people should exchange ideas and views. And for the reasons I tried to give earlier, and I won't repeat them, it seems to me that the Prince of Wales is placed in a position <coughs> where his role within the apparatus of the governance of the state in its widest sense, just as a senior civil servant, um, means that he has something which is relevant and rather distinct from an ordinary member of the public to communicate to ministers. And I think he should be able to do that. And indeed, he is now in a position to do it. Now, of course, it would be abusive if a person were to try to exercise some undue influence. You know, unless you do what I say, you, know, you won't get an invitation to something. I don't know what it should be. But I have to say to you, this is, uh, I think, rather far-fetched. The question is, is it desirable that based on the experience he's getting from his preparation as heir to the throne of both seeing state documents and involving himself in the public sphere frequently so that he's getting information fed into him, is it desirable or not and in the public interest he should be able to communicate what he's picked up coupled with his own opinion, to ministers. I think it is. But then, as I say, I'm not a Republican. I happen to think constitutional monarchy and this system actually serves us rather well. I think it's rather a good thing for ministers to get a letter which may challenge some of their assumptions and which at least requires them to sit down and give some thought to how they're going to respond to it. I think that's a very valuable thing. Final question, and then there's, there'll be a wide reception outside, so if you have any more questions.
Um, you mentioned defence before, and it appears that most people are signposting that further defence cuts may follow. Um, do you think that actually reflects what the average Conservative voter wants? And do you think it will have an effect on Britain's standing in the world if that were to happen? I find it difficult to see how in the present climate there is going to be <coughs> very much possibility of uh, making any defence cuts at all. Um, I think that the big issue that we are going to have to confront uh, is whether, in fact, how and we may have to increase defence expenditure, but that's partly will be dependent on the international situation. Um, it's, it's, a big, it's a big question, and I accept it. Um, and in a faint sense, it's not, I think, amenable to rather glib answers of, you know, I promise to do 2%. Uh, I, I, that seems to me to slightly miss the point. It may even be that we're going to end up in three years' time having to spend more than 2%. Um, what does the Conservative Party at large think? I don't know. I'm always a bit wary of trying to analyse what your supporters may think. I think that people are worried about the deteriorating international situation. I mean, there are obviously two key issues here. There might be a third, but the two key issues are firstly Russia, whose behaviour and flagrant violations of international law bluntly resembles that of Hitler in the run-up to the Second World War. It's a bit difficult to see the distinction with what's happened in the Crimea. I think that's profoundly worrying, and I think it's absolutely necessary that we have sufficiently credible deterrence, both conventional and nuclear, to make sure that that can be checked. Uh, I don't mean by that we're about to go to war with Russia, but I mean to say that we've got to prevent this situation deteriorating further. Um, there's anxiety about the Middle East, and I think it's a very real anxiety, although it's of a slightly different nature, because... Uh, but it's complex. And there are other places around the world where there's the potential for flashpoints. So yes, I mean, the, the history of the last 20 years is that progressively the Western nations, after the fall of the Iron Curtain, have been lessening the burden of defence expenditure. That's very understandable. Um, am I concerned that we may have got to the point where it's, we're very close to it not being credible in view of the threats that are developing? Yes, I am. And I think whichever party gets into government or forms a coalition, uh, on the basis it's a mainstream party that puts the defence of the realm as one of the priorities of government, is going to have to tackle some very awkward issues over this.